All right, thank you. Okay. okay. Yeah, thank you again for the introduction and for the invitation. Um, it's, it's my pleasure to uh, discuss our work and I'd love to get comments and feedback from you. So um, some of this work was published recently and then the second half is, is new data that we would love feedback on. So I'm, I'm a virologist as mentioned and we started working on SARS-CoV-2 back in January of 2020. Um, and our initial plan was to do a uh, genome-wide CRISPR screen to try to identify host genes that were essential for infection. So I want to introduce the folks who led the work. So from my lab at Yale, it was two postdocs, Jin Wei and Mia Alfaharo. And then our close collaborators at the Broad Institute at Harvard MIT. Um, this was led by John Dench and Ruth and Peter were in his lab. So today I'll talk to you about the genetic screens we did to identify host genes essential for SARS-CoV-2 and other highly pathogenic coronaviruses. I'll then go into the role of epigenetic regulators in coronavirus infection that we identified in these screens. I'll highlight specifically the mechanism of the switch sniff chromatin remodeling complex and how that uh, regulates SARS-CoV-2 infection. And then finally, I'll go into how this work has led to novel host-directed therapeutic targets for uh, current and emerging coronaviruses. Okay. So we think that understanding how host viruses interact is critical for both prognostics and therapeutics. So it may explain what underlies the variation in COVID-19 severity. It may explain why uh, certain tissues are susceptible and within those tissues why certain cell types are susceptible. And probably more practically, it tells us you know, can can we target host host genes or gene products with small molecules um, to prevent or treat uh, viral infection? So to approach this problem, um, we we wanted to genome to a, to do a genome wide for genetic screen, and we used a cell line called Vero E6 cells. So this is used to grow tons of viruses, including SARS CoV two. At the time, it wasn't known to uh, grow SARS-CoV-2, but we tested every virus, every cell line we had in our freezer um, with the virus, and we found that this cell grew the, the virus the best and was susceptible to viral-induced cell death. It also is susceptible to all the other highly pathogenic human coronaviruses. So the only problem is it's a, a monkey. It's an African green monkey uh, library. So we had to generate a custom CRISPR library targeting the, the monkey genome. So we, we generate 80,000 unique CRISPR guide RNAs targeting all 20,000 monkey genes uh, four, individu four individual times. And then we did this uh, at a 1,000 X scale. We then took this giant pool of cells and we challenged it with different viruses, which I'll mention, including SARS-CoV-2. And when you give this big pool of cells with SARS-CoV-2, the virus will kill the vast majority of normal wild type cells. But then cells that have CRISPR guide RNAs in them targeting essential genes will be resistant to viral infection and viral induced cell death, and they will survive. And then what we do is we sequence the CRISPR guide RNAs in those surviving cells, and then we can map them back to identify host genes that are essential for infection. Okay. So the screen was successful and identified both proviral genes and antiviral genes. And here, the proviral genes we call resistance genes because they make you, when you knock them out, they're, you're resistant to viral infection. <clears throat> so you, you see the top hit is the viral receptor, ACE2. So this gave us great confidence uh, in, in the robustness of the screen. And you see down here in pink, about the number 20 hit or so, is cathepsin L, which in, in viral cells is the essential protease that's needed to activate and cleave the viral spike protein. But beyond those two genes, Every other gene uh, that we identified was completely novel in, in, in the field of coronavirus host interactions. And what was really surprising to us was that the vast majority of other genes were involved in epigenetics. And you know these were mostly genes that protein products functioned in the nucleus, um, which at first didn't make a ton of sense to us because this is an RNA virus that sought to replicate exclusively in the cytoplasm. So why are we getting all these nuclear factors? Also, we've screened about 20 other viruses and um, most of these genes have never come up before, uh, so we thought it was specific. So we really wanted to investigate what they were. So the, these epigenetic regulators fall into a couple buckets. They include histone-modifying enzymes, 
such as KDM 6A, Jumanji Domain 6, which, which directly mod, mod, modulate histones. We had nucleus home regulators, chromatin regulators, uh, most notably the switch sniff chromatin remodeling complex, which I will talk about more, and then transcription factors, including SMAD3 and SMAD4. And these five different conditions, A, B, C, D, E, here are just shown different viral concentrations or time points. Um, and really the conclusion from that is none of it matters. If you had any virus or a lot of virus, and no matter when you're sequencing, you get kind of the same results, which gives us confidence. So, and then in the opposite direction, so these are antiviral genes, you see that these genes are also enriched in epigenetic regulators. So the top two hits are HERA and CABIN, which are two of the four members of the larger HUCA complex, which is uh, regulates histones as well. And then you see also um, chromatin modifying enzymes as well. So the first thing we did is we wanted to validate the screen and make sure that what we're seeing was real. So we generated 50 individual cell lines for the top 25 genes where we knocked out uh, the gene of interest with two independent CRISPR guides and then challenged them with virus. And you can see our control cells are here in black. And if you knock out genes that are proviral, so this includes ACE2 and Ctepsinel, they're in red, and almost all of them validate. And then if you knock out genes that are antiviral, shown here in blue, once again, almost all of them validate. So when you knock them out, the viruses are much more likely to die from infection. Um, whereas you knock out the red genes, they're more protected. Okay. So, you know, this was um, early on in the pandemic, and we really wanted to figure out as much as we could about all of these genes as possible in the, and try to put them into functional categories to figure out their mechanism. So the approach we took was to screen multiple other coronaviruses to kind of give us mechanistic insight into how these genes are regulating SARS-CoV-2 infection. And these are the viruses we use. So we use MERS coronavirus. We used a, a bat coronavirus called HKU5 that instead of expressing the bat spike protein, ex expresses the SARS-CoV-1 spike protein. And then we use VSV, um, that which is a rhabdovirus that infects cows that expresses the SARS-CoV-2 spike protein instead of the VSVG glycoprotein. So that last virus mediates entry into cells via the spike protein, but once it's inside those cells, all of the intracellular replication is with the VSV machinery, which is completely unrelated from coronaviruses. Okay. So we did the same screens with these other viruses, once again in Vero E6 cells. And this is the data I just showed you with SARS-CoV-2, where ACE2 is the top proviral hit. The, the next virus we screened was this recombinant, replication competent VSV that expresses the SARS-CoV-2 spike. And what was really surprising to us is that even though this only has the spike protein in common with SARS-CoV-2, that nearly all of the genes were, were identical. There's about 90% concordance between the wild type SARS-CoV-2 and this replication component VSV expressing the SARS-CoV-2 spike. And that's true in both the proviral and the antiviral directions. Next, we tested this bat coronavirus recombinant that expresses the SARS-CoV-1 spike. And once again, this looked just like SARS-CoV-2 and the VSV SARS-CoV-2. So also suggesting that um, most of the host genes are acting <coughs> excuse me, at the level of viral entry. And also suggests that um, they're SARS lineage specific. So SARS-1 and SARS-2 are kind of scoring the same way here. Um, so it's not, there's nothing that's really SARS-2 specific. And then finally, we did MERS coronavirus. And so we used two different MERS coronaviruses, um, just a wild type MERS coronavirus and one with just a, a single tissue culture adapted mutation that changes its replication. And you see that the two MERS viruses look identical to each other. And you can see there's a lot of correlation between the MERS viruses and the coronavirus and the SARS coronaviruses. So you see Cathepsinel scores in all five, which is a positive control. You see um, dirk one a KDM6A, and ERD1A, also pan coronavirus essential. You see that ACE2 is specific to SARS lineage coronaviruses, which is a nice control. Whereas for MERS, the receptor is called DPP4, and that comes up for MERS, but not for any of the other uh, SARS lineage viruses. And in the antiviral direction, you see kind of a similar trend. Um, most genes are common to both, and then some are specific to just SARS lineage viruses. 
where we do see one TRAF3 that is um, proviral for SARS lineage viruses, but antiviral for, for MERS. So this gave us, um, really enabled us to kind of classify the genes into different categories. And we took the top genes from each screen and then pooled them in these buckets. So we identified um, genes that were essential for all of the viruses tested. So this included the protease cathepsinel, along with ARD1A, the histone modifying enzymes, cadm 6 a and Jumon Domain 6. We also identified um, genes that were MERS specific, including the MERS receptor, DPP4. We identified genes that were important for all of the SARS lineage entry processes, that was most notably ACE2, SMARK A4, HMGB1, DERK1A, and then DPF2. And I'm going to come back to SMARK A4 and talk about that in detail. Okay. So this is just kind of a broad overview of um, how our hits fell. So we have ACE2, we have the protease cathepsinel, we found the entire switch sniff chromatin remodeling complex, and we got all these histone modifying enzymes. And in the antiviral direction, we got this uh, hookah complex. In addition, we got this transcription factor SMAD3 and SMAD4, which are important in TGF beta signaling, but we didn't get any other TGF beta process. And then we got this nucleosome binding protein and chemokine called HMGB1. And the idea was that the proviral genes were turning on some unknown proviral gene program, and these antiviral genes were turning on this or we're either blocking this process or turning on an antiviral program. So we next did pathway analysis to try to get a handle as to um, you know, what could be happening. And you know the only real informative thing was that it identified the switch sniff complex, which we kind of already knew from the top, the second hit being the switch sniff complex. So we want to investigate that further. So this is new data that's not published. And this is um, in my lab led by Jin Wei and then it's a close collaboration with Sagal Kaddish's lab at Dana-Farber uh, in Boston and her uh, student, AJ Patil. Okay, so what, what is the chromatin remodeling, the switch sniff chromatin remodeling complex? So it was first discovered in yeast, so it's highly conserved throughout eukaryotes. And um, it's a large protein complex that has a single catalytic subunit. The gene is called SMARK A4, or also called, used to be called BRG1. And this protein complex is targeted to specific sites in the genome. And there it mobilizes nucleosomes. It slides and it gets rid of them. And this opens chromatin. And the open chromatin is more favorable to turning on gene expression at those open chromatin sites. And notably, it's mutated in about 20% of human cancers. And this, is, this makes it the most common um, epigenetic regulatory entity in human cancer. These are all the switch sniff complex genes. And then you can see that nearly all of them scored as proviral for SARS-CoV-2. So we, need to, we wanted to ask what, what was switch sniff complex regulating and how is that important for coronavirus infection? So we first wanted to ask which of the, the different switch sniff complexes was important. And there's really three complexes that have been described. Um, one is called PBAF, one is called CBAF or canonical BAF, and then one is called non-canonical BAF. And you can see that the blue components across these complexes are similar, but then the yellow, orange, and green components define the, the separate entities. And they have sl slightly different functions as well. So we knocked out the unique components individually to PBAF, CBAF, and non-canonical BAF. And then we tested them for susceptibility to SARS-CoV-2 infection. So our control is shown here in blue. If we knock out the common subunit, which is the catalytic site, SMARK A4, you can see that we get resistance. If we knock out arid one a which is uh, unique to CBAF, we get resistance. So this tells us CBAF is important. But if we knock out ARID2 or BRD9, which are important for PBAF and non-canonical BAF, but not CBAF, we see that they don't play a role. So this tells us that CBAF or canonical BAF is the switch sniff complex that's important for infection. We next wanted to ask um, whether the ATPase activity of this complex was essential. And here, what we did is we made single cell knockout clones of SMARK A4, and this is the catalytic subunit of that switch sniff complex. And if you knock out SMARK A4, you get complete resistance to infection. So that's shown by the top right graph. If you complement it with a wild type copy, you could able, you're able to rescue infection. And that's the bottom left graph. And then if you complement it with a catalytically inactive um, mutant, this K785R mutant, 
you can rescue protein levels of SMARK A4, but you can't rescue, rescue viral infection. So this tells us that the ATPase activity of SMARK A4 uh, is critical for coronavirus infection. Okay. So next, our, we wanted to ask where in the viral life cycle um, SMARK A4 is acting. And our, our CRISPR screen suggested it was entry. Um, but here we formally proved that. So here we're using a pseudovirus. So this is a, um, a VSV virus that expresses a coronavirus spike protein, but not the VSV uh, entry protein. And then we use um, luciferase as a readout. So this measure, this upon infection, you get light. So our wild type cells uh, are at 100%. If you knock it out, knock out SMARK A4, uh, you lose susceptibility to infection. And once again, just like the last graph, you can complement it with wild type SMARK A4, but not with the catalytically dead. So this confirms that SMARK A4 is essential for SARS lineage virus entry. You see that SARS-CoV-1 pseudovirus looks exactly like SARS-CoV-2. And then MERS um, is indifferent to whether or not SMARK A4 is present or absent. So this tells us that SMARK A4 and the switch SNF complex are critical for SARS lineage virus entry. So we want to know the mechanism of this and how it switch SNF promotes infection. So we did RNA-seq of wild type cells, SMARK A4 knockout cells, and then SMARK A4 knockout cells that were complemented with either wild type SMARK A4 or the catalytically inactive SMARK A4. And right away, you see that the controls, um, so SMARK A4 is up here. You can see that we have officially knocked it out and then we're able to complement it. And then we asked what genes would be um, in common between the complemented the first column and the wild type, but not the knockout or the catalytically dead. And right away, what jumped out at us was ACE2. So ACE2 is almost completely gone uh, in the knockouts. And that's just shown here by qPCR. So we had more than two log reduction in ACE2 mRNA expression in the absence of SMARK A4. And that can be complemented. And then also on the protein level, this is a Western blot looking at ACE2 protein levels you see that the wild type um, cells have ACE2, the knockouts are, don't have ACE2, but th this can be complemented. I'm sorry, down here. Okay. So we, we identified that the switch SNF complex can regulate um, ACE2 expression. And we now wanted to ask, is this a, a reasonable host therapeutic target? And um, even though it's highly conserved, it's actually potentially a druggable target. And there is a, a nice paper in the Journal of Medicinal Chemistry a few years ago that identified a series of small molecules that could specifically block the ATPase activity of the switch SNF complex. And um, that compound, we just call it compound, compound 12 or compound 16, but there's a family of them. So here we wanted to test whether or not the small molecule drug rather than the genetic knockout can have the same phenotype. So we use compound 12 at increasing doses and measured um, ACE2 mRNA expression in just vero cells. And you could see that when you give compound 12 in a dose-dependent way, that you actually completely get rid of ACE2, both at the mRNA level on top and then the protein level on the bottom. You see that this is true in a human liver cell line, although maybe to a lesser extent, where you see some ACE2 protein um, and a little bit of transcript. And then you see also in a human lung cell line, KL3, where um, there is still an effect, but it's, it's not quite as robust in the, in the viral cell. Okay. So we next want to test whether or not we can use this compound 12 drug and whether it would work against other um, SARS-CoV-2 variants of concern. Um, so th this is the old pangolin inch, but most of our studies were done with the original uh, prototype in the U.S., the Washington L1 virus shown here. And you could show, see that the virus can kill cells, but when you give compound 12, it protects them from infection. And this is true for this panel of other viruses, including alpha, beta, gamma, uh, and delta viruses. Um, so, and this is consistent with the mechanism of action, which is it regulates ACE2. And since all the variants of concern still use the same ACE2 receptor, uh, this is consistent. Okay. Next, you know, we, um, while we had robust uh, data in cell lines, we really wanted to test how important this was for um, primary cells, so cells that weren't cancerous or transformed. 
and really the cells that are the physiologic target of infection. So we used a model um, uh, called human bronchial epithelial cells. So these are primary human airway cells, and we culture them uh, at an air-liquid interface culture. So this is basically, it's a well that has like a semi-porous filter in it, and you can culture the cells on that, uh, on that membrane filter. And at the top, the apical side, the cells are exposed to air, mimicking kind of the, the airway. And on the bottom, uh, they're exposed to liquid with growth factors that keeps them happy. And then, um, so you grow these cells for about a month in this air-liquid interface, and then you could treat them with compound 12, which is the SMARK A4 inhibitor uh, or a control. And then four days later, we infected them with SARS-CoV-2. And much to our surprise, the um, compound 12 almost completely prevented SARS-CoV-2 replication and, and frankly, even better than it did in cell lines. So this is hours post-infection on the x-axis and then log of infectious virus is measured by plaque assay on the y-axis. And you can see this is our background at one hour post-infection. At 24 hours post-infection, our, our uh, mock drug control, you get exponential increase in infection, and that continues over the course of 72 hours. Whereas in the two drug-treated groups, you get complete resistance to SARS-CoV-2. So almost a, a four to five log phenotype at 72 hours post-infection. So... To conclude, we performed the first genome-wide CRISPR screens to identify host genes essential for uh, both SARS-CoV-2, but also other highly pathogenic coronaviruses. We identified that canonical BAF specifically and its ATPase activity are essential for, for viral infection in SARS-CoV-2. We showed that the mechanism of this is that the SWITCHNIF complex regulates ACE2 receptor expression which explains why it's essential for SARS-CoV-1 and SARS-CoV-2 entry, but not MERS coronavirus. And then we highlighted that SWITCHNIF is a potential therapeutic target for SARS lineage viruses. And I should mention that there are, um, you know, companies actively pursuing um, uh, SWITCHNIF small molecules for, for cancer that could potentially be repurposed for, for viral infection. And this is kind of our final model. So, Shown over here in the green is what happens in a normal wild-type cell. So you have the SWITCHNIF protein complex, and the catalytic subunit is SMARK A4, which sucks the SWITCHNIF. SMARK A4, we think, has to bind to one of several transcription factors. Um, and these transcription factors actually target the SWITCHNIF complex to the ACE2 enhancer and promoter, uh, because SWITCHNIF itself lacks any DNA binding specificity. So it, with, without a DNA binding protein stuck to it, the SWITCHNIF complex can't find its way around the genome. And when SWITCHNIF binds to this transcription factor, it targets it to ACE2, it opens up the chromatin and then turns on the receptor expression at that locus. At that locus. In the absence of SMARK-A4, you could still get potentially transcription factor binding to the ACE2 enhancer and promoter, but the chromatin remains closed, so you get no receptor expression. And then shown here on the right is if you knock out those transcription factors, you can get switch sniff complex um, expressed, but it can't find the ACE2 enhancer and promoter elements, so the chromatin, chromatin also remains closed. And once again, you get no receptor expression. In the absence of receptor expression, you get no virus infection. So I want to thank um, the folks who really led this work. So from my lab, um, Jin Wei was, was the lead on this, uh, with Mia Alfaharo also playing a really important role. Um, our collaborators, uh, Shin Yan, Matt Simon, David Van Dyke, uh, John Dench at the Broad, and then also especially Seagal Kaddish, who's at Dana-Farber. And um, I look forward to any questions.